Marriage and the Sanctuary, the greatest love story of the ages. In this presentation, we are going to compare some of the characteristics of the Jewish wedding during Bible times with the path that we are going to follow through the sanctuary. This not only reinforces a wonderful picture of God's infinite love for us, but it will help us to understand His expectations of us as His bride. As I studied into some of the traditions of the Jewish wedding and the preceding events, I have endeavored to stay as close to the traditions that are upheld with biblical descriptions as possible. History, other than that from the Bible, should always be used only as a supplement when compared to the greater weight of evidence as found in the eternal Word of God. We'll begin with Hebrews 13.4. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. In the very beginning, God ordained the ordinance of marriage when he created and then married Adam and Eve. In the New Testament, we find that his first miracle was performed at a wedding. Isaiah 54, 5 says, For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. Jesus Christ is the bridegroom, and the church, collectively, all together, is his bride. Genesis 2.24 Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This is the way that God ordained it. In the Jewish world, some consider a man or a woman to be only a half until they are married and become one flesh. Although this seems an exaggerated version of this verse, this is definitely true of the church and Jesus. For he says in John 15:5, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. We are not complete until we have Jesus. There are more dimensions to the biblical wedding picture, however. The guests at the wedding represent individual members of the church. Individually, we are guests at the wedding, or bridesmaids and groomsmen. Luke 5:33 to 35 says, And they said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often, and make prayers, and likewise the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink. And he said unto them, Can ye make the children of the bride chamber fast, while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come, when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and they shall fast in those days. In Revelation, we find a picture of a woman who represents the true church, and she's standing on the moon and clothed with the sun. Revelation 19, 7-9 says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints and he said unto me write blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb and he said unto me these are the true sayings of god so here we have the bride, and also those that are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb pictured in the same verse. Again, the wedding picture gains new facets because the new Jerusalem is also pictured as the bride. Revelation 21, 1 and 2. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Also in Revelation 21, 9 and 10, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to the great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now this may seem like a complicated idea with all these different pictures of the bride, 
but it's not the only place that this happens in the Bible. We're all familiar with the fact that Jesus is not only pictured as the good shepherd, but he's also pictured as the Lamb of God. Different symbolisms are used in different places and in different contexts. Interestingly enough, the Jews also considered the Sabbath to be the bride. There are some distinct connections between the two. In the Jewish wedding, there were two parts, Eruzin or Kedushin, which is the betrothal, and then there's the Nesuin, which is the consummation ceremony. The link between betrothal and the Sabbath comes in the meaning of the word Kedushin, which actually means sanctification. In Ezekiel 20.12 it says, Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths, to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. So this is a sign of betrothal. Every bride likes to save the first token of affection that she receives from her suitor, whether it be flowers or whatever it may be. We are told that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. That's in Mark 2:27. It was a gift. The Sabbath was actually the first full day that God spent with mankind after they were created. Genesis 2, 1 through 3 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it, he had rested from all his work which God created and made. And one more here in Ezekiel 20, 19 and 20. It says, I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them and hallow my Sabbaths. They shall be a sign between me and you that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Each preparation day, as the sun sets and the sky is illuminated with beauty, we can remember this sign that we are betrothed to Jesus Christ. Before we begin our journey, let's read one more verse to establish that we are the bride of Christ. This is from 2 Corinthians 11, 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Let's have an overview of the sanctuary path. The Jewish wedding and its preceding events is split into three main parts, the courtship, the betrothal, and the wedding day. The courtship and the betrothal we will cover in the first half of this DVD. The wedding day, or the Nesuin, we will cover in the second half. Now when you look in Bible times, marriages were arranged. We find the story in Genesis 24 of Abraham sending his servant Eliezer to find a wife for Isaac. This was a common practice for a servant to find a potential spouse for a young person of marrying age. And often, even when the parents were going to the Jewish feast, they would keep an eye out for prospects also. Now ours is an arranged marriage. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14 says, God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we were chosen from the beginning. And again, in Ephesians 1, 4, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. The sanctuary is a picture of this arrangement. So we will be using its structure as a model to better understand the relationship of God's people, his bride, to the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. Exodus 25, 8 says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Also, Psalm 77, 13 says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? So the sanctuary gives us a picture of God's way. 
Now, as we move to our sanctuary model, we see a white curtain around the entire court and Christ in the gate. This represents the arrangement of the marriage and the beginning of the courtship. In the sanctuary model, it's kind of interesting, an interesting play on words since the courtship actually takes place in the court. In the book of Ruth, we find the love story of Boaz and Ruth, whose previous husband, a relative of Boaz, had died. Let's pick up the story in Ruth 3, 7 through 9. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. And she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. Spread forth thy skirt is kind of like a metaphor of the securities and protections of marriage. In Bible times, women didn't usually remain unmarried. It was much safer arrangement for them to be married. They either lived with their father or they would live with their husband. So this spread forth thy skirt is a representation of the curtain of protection. This is Christ's robe of righteousness, which is freely offered to all. Second Peter 3 9 says, The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In Ezekiel, we find a distinct allusion to the sanctuary. Ezekiel 16, 8, and then verse 10. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread forth my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. I clothed thee also with broidered work, and shod thee with badger's skin, and I girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. The fine linen is a reference to the curtain around the courtyard. And you'll find some other comparisons too with the badger's skin. These were some of the coverings that were actually on the sanctuary. So in the Bible, the prophets led by God himself compare the marriage relationship to the sanctuary. Marriage arrangements and other matters of importance were often settled at the gate. Now, as we followed the story of Boaz and Ruth, this is the case. And I'm not going to read all of this here in Ruth 4, 1 through 10. But Boaz went up to the gate. There was a shoe exchanged and Boaz then said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's, that was Naomi's husband, and all that was Chilean's and Malon's of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife. And he says, Ye are my witnesses this day. So there in the gate, this marriage was arranged. For us, Jesus has the arrangement totally under control. For Jesus not only sits in the gate, he is the door. John 10, 9 says, I am the door. For by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. He's the only way in. John 14, 6 tells us, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We too are to be in the gate as witnesses. Proverbs 8.34 says, Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates and waiting at the post of my doors. We can also help to arrange and invite others to the marriage. Isaiah 43.10 Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen. And Mark 16.15 And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Here during the arrangement, the dowry is settled upon and a token of it is given. Let's pick up the story of Eliezer. This was Abraham's servant again, as he is choosing Rebekah to marry Isaac. Genesis 24, 52 and 53. 
And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, this was Laban saying that he could marry Rebekah, he worshiped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah. And he gave also to her brother and her mother precious things. According to the dictionary, the definition of a dowry is the gift of a husband for a wife. It could be anything from money to property to work, as it was in the case of Jacob for Rachel. Often, at least part of it was coins put under the headpiece that would be worn for the wedding ceremony. This particular headpiece in the picture is Turkish, and that's why it's red and not white but this is what the Turkish bride wears for her wedding. These coins in this headpiece would, of course, be carefully guarded by the bride. It is possible that this is what Jesus was referring to in his parable found in Luke 18, 8 and 9. Either that woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it, and when she hath found it, she calleth all her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. So you can picture this a lot more if you're thinking of a bride and she's lost one of the coins for her, her headpiece for her marriage. We have been given a spiritual headpiece like this. Deuteronomy 6, 1 and 6 through 9 says, now these are the commandments, the statutes, the judgments which the Lord commanded to teach you. And further on down it says, They shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. It is interesting that before the listing of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, God says, and I paraphrase, I am the Lord who brought you from your previous dwelling and am bringing you to a new way of life with me. We also have been given a token of this covenant. It never ceases to amaze me how God makes these tokens of the covenant things that last through all time. Genesis 9, 13, and 16. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. Now, I believe that each part or color of the rainbow represents an important part of the church and its relationship to Christ. A rainbow is the result of taking white light and splitting it into all the colors that it's made of. Likewise, the colors show us the characteristics of Jesus, who is the light of the world. They also show the characteristics that his people should be reflecting to the world. We're just going to go through them quickly for the sake of time, but you will notice that each of them is part of the everlasting covenant, which is what the rainbow represents. Red represents the blood of the everlasting covenant. This is Christ's blood. We are to wash our robes in the blood of the Lamb. Orange is a representation of fire and the glory of God. We are to have God's word, his glory revealed as a fire in our hearts. Yellow or gold is a representation of the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Jeremiah 31 3 says, The Lord hath appeared of old time unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Green represents hope. Just as green leaves in the spring give us hope that winter is past, we have hope in the Lord of eternal life to come. Blue represents the law, which is a transcript of God's character. The Israelites were to put blue borders on their garments to remind them of the commandments of God. And purple represents royalty and the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, when he will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. So now, whenever you see a rainbow, you will remember that it is a symbol of the everlasting covenant relationship between Christ and his church, those who keep the commandments of God 
and have the faith of Jesus as described in Revelation 14:12. Needless to say, God has given us numerous beautiful tokens of his affection. It's amazing how they are seen through the ages of time. The next step in the courtship process was the bride price, or in modern days that would be the proposal. Exodus 22:17. He shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. After the arrangement of the marriage, the first time that the betrothed saw each other, the groom would pay the bride price in full and would declare in a loud voice, The price has been paid in full. In our sanctuary model, this lines up with the altar of burnt offering, where a lamb was sacrificed for the sins of the people. It's pretty easy to figure out what the bride price is that has been paid for us. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And again in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This was not a gift to be taken lightly. John 15:13 says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. This is the most valuable gift that could be given. In some cultures, the value of the bride is actually seen in comparison to the value of the bride price that was paid. The bride price paid for us shows without a doubt our value to Christ, and He would have died even for just one of us. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The story of Jesus on the cross as told in the Gospels makes an interesting connection with the bride price. In Mark 15.37 it says, and Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. Again in Matthew 27, 50, it says, Jesus, when he had cried with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And in John 19, 30, it tells us what he said. He, Jesus, said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now in the Greek, it is finished actually means paid in full. So Jesus, when he gave the most beautiful gift to us of his life and his death, he said right before he died, paid in full, the bride price has been paid. A while back, I heard a preacher state, when a man truly loves his wife and treats her kindly, it's a woman's automatic reaction to love him back. This should definitely be our reaction. No one could love us more than God does. 1 John 4.19 says, We love him because he first loved us. This is important in the next stage of the courtship. In the Hebrew culture, even though marriages were arranged, the bride-to-be was given the opportunity to accept or to decline. So you didn't end up with marriages where the bride didn't want to be married, typically, in the Hebrew culture. We see this in the story of Isaac and Rebekah. Even after Laban and Bethuel had agreed to the marriage, Rebekah was summoned. Genesis 24, 57 and 58. And they said, We will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. And they called Rebekah and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. In our sanctuary model, this takes place at the laver, where the priests wash their hands and the sacrifices. This is a representation of baptism. When we are baptized, we are answering yes to Jesus' proposal. John 3, 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Let me just interject here. For those who have not reached the age of accountability, 
and so have not been baptized, or those who for some reason are unable to be baptized, like the thief on the cross was, the baptism of Christ will cover them. God can read our hearts. But for those of us that can, we are to be baptized. Mark 16:16 16, 16 says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now there's another small picture of baptism here. When we wash one another's feet, it's a little reminder of this grand decision of baptism. John 13, 8, Jesus is washing Peter's feet, and Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Further down in John 13, 14, and 15, it says, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Now, we need to understand that unlike our modern engagement, the betrothal process was a very serious one. And if sometime afterward the engagement was broken off, the young woman, if she was a Jewish, could not be married to anyone else without first receiving a paper of divorce by the rabbi. We can see this in the story of Mary and Joseph. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. Matthew 1, 18 and 19. We need to consider seriously whenever we make a vow, but especially when we make a vow to follow God. Ecclesiastes 5, 4 and 5 says, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better it is that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. And even in reference to the marriage vow, Malachi 2, 15 and 16 says, Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. God hates divorce. Luke 9, 32. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. And of course, we know what was the result of Lot's wife when she turned back. Second Peter 2, 21. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than, after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Needless to say, when we make the decision to accept Christ, it needs to be forever, forever and ever. Here's an interesting connection with the labor in our sanctuary model. Have you ever noticed when girls or women or even men are courting someone special, they start looking in the mirror a lot to make sure that they look acceptable to their significant other? Well, it's interesting that the laver was made of the looking glasses or the mirrors of the women. Exodus 38, 8. And he made the laver of brass and the foot of brass, of the looking glasses of the women assembling, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. James 1, 22 through 25 shows us that our mirror is the perfect law of liberty. This is what we should be looking into. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So the labor is kind of like the law of liberty, but it would be worthless for us to use without water in it. The labor would be worthless without the water, or who wants it to drink from an empty cup? But Jesus is the water of life. 
he said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Matthew 5.17 It's a gift. In the same way as the labor and the water go together, so Jesus and the law are not to be separated in our lives. The law shows us that we need cleansing, and Jesus is the cleansing agent, just like the water. When we answer yes to the marriage proposal, we will reflect both Jesus and the law in our everyday lives. As Rebecca consented to become the bride of Isaac before she had even seen him, so we consent to become the bride of Christ, even though we have never seen him. Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. 1 Peter 1.18 And in John 2.29 it says, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. One fact that I found to be interesting in my study was that historically, most of the wedding arrangement and planning was actually done by the groom, not the bride as is now done. Jesus says this to us, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty-eight through 30 so Jesus says, I'll take care of it. I'll take care of all the little details. Also, in Bible times, betrothal prohibited the woman to all other men, even though the marriage was not yet consummated. We are to be Christ's and His only. Now we're going to learn a little bit about the betrothal ceremony. It included both the signing of the ketubah and the cup of acceptance. In our sanctuary model, we are entering the holy place. The cup of acceptance and the signing of the ketubah takes us into a covenant relationship with Christ. The ketubah was signed to record the agreed terms of the proposal. It details the husband's obligations to his wife, among which are food and clothing and that the groom would provide for the needs of the bride during the one to two year waiting period before the marriage ceremony. The Bible is our ketubah or contract. Second Corinthians one twenty says, For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. Some people like to say that the Bible is yea and nay, but here it says that the promises are yea and amen. That sounds like an I do to me. This helps us to be partakers of the divine nature. The signing of the ketubah had to be done in front of at least two unrelated witnesses. The Bible gives us more than ample evidence from the pen of many different and otherwise unrelated men. The Bible itself says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. 1 Corinthians 13, 1, Matthew 18, 16, and Deuteronomy 19, 15. Our ketubah comes from the pen of multiple witnesses who can testify to the faithfulness of God. Here is a beautiful betrothal statement found in Hosea. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness, and in judgment, and in loving kindness, and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. Hosea 2, 19 and 20. Now let's talk a little bit about the cup of acceptance. The groom would offer the bride a cup of wine or grape juice, and if she accepted the conditions of the ketubah, she would drink from the cup. The groom would not drink again until they were married at the marriage supper. This tradition has made it somewhat intact into many modern weddings. Among the Jews, however, there is another interesting connection. Here's a picture of a table set for Shabbat or Sabbath, 
and it includes a Kadush cup, yet another connection between the Sabbath and the Bride of Christ. In Matthew 26, 27 through 29, it tells us, And he, which is Jesus, took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This sounds distinctly like a betrothal cup drunk with the members of the newly forming Christian church. It is even more interesting when you realize that this immediately followed the foot washing. When you realize that drinking the cup is a betrothal agreement, it gives new meaning to 1 Corinthians 10.21. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. If we're not careful, we may be drinking from the cup of the harlot of Revelation 17 instead of from the betrothal cup. I have found no documentation about the kiss at a wedding in Bible times. It seems like maybe in those days a kiss may have been used somewhat like a handshake. Um, you find in 2 Corinthians 13.12 it says, Greet one another with a holy kiss. But Song of Solomon compares a more personal kiss with wine, so I've placed it here. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Song of Solomon 1 verse 2. Now, once the betrothal process is complete, the bride is allowed to use the name of the groom. This name for us is Christian, and this is a biblical term. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Acts 26, 28. And then 1 Peter 4, 16 says, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. As Christians, we are given privileges in Jesus' name. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. Acts 4.12 And again in John 16.23 Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. And then John 20, verse 31 But these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. This idea gives new meaning when we read the third commandment, because in the Bible times, often a name was a representation of the character of a person. When we use God's name, we should also assume his character. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless, that taketh his name in vain. Exodus 20, verse 7. Here's another connection from 2 Timothy 2, 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. We need to leave the things of this world, the city of destruction, and follow the upward path. Isaiah 4.1 tells us an interesting story. It says, And in that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. Now keep in mind, at the signing of the ketubah, the part, part of the groom's responsibilities was to provide for the food and the clothing of his betrothed. Yet, here we have some women who just want their reproach removed by using the name of the man, but they want to do their own thing otherwise. So, what does it mean to wear our own apparel? In Matthew 22, 2-14, we find a clue. The kingdom of heaven, said Jesus, is like unto a certain king. Now, this king invites his acquaintances to his son's wedding. They are even hateful and kill some of his servants. But let's pick it up in verse 8. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden are not worthy. 
Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways, and gathered all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw that there was a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Here's a picture that someone made of those who would rather have their own robes of self-righteousness or even respectability instead of the wedding garment, the seamless robe of Christ's righteousness that is freely given to all who accept it. For a more literal perspective, when we look at the sanctuary, God took great care to detail exactly what the priest in the sanctuary should wear, and he cares too about how we dress. Wherever we go, our dress should be only to the glory of God. So what about this phrase, eating our own bread? In the Bible, bread often represents Christ. John 6.51 says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. It also represents the Bible, or the Word of God, Matthew 4.4. 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Just as we eat daily, we need to study the Word of God daily. This actually is part of the sanctification or betrothal process. Ephesians 5.25-27 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Those then who want to eat their own bread are a representation of those who choose to study the things of this world, instead of the things of God. One of my favorite authors wrote in regard to naming the name of Christ, Let those who name the name of Christ remember that individually they are making an impression favorable or unfavorable to Bible religion on the minds of all with whom they come in contact. Now, in the olden days, a home was prepared by the bridegroom for his bride, and also a marriage chamber. The bride would traditionally go to live with the groom's family, thus boys added to a family and girls subtracted, giving reason for the birth of a son to be considered to be a particular blessing. The bridegroom and the bride would be separated for a time while the groom went to build a home and a marriage chamber for them. This home had to be approved by his father before he could marry his bride. This is true in our spiritual marriage to Christ Jesus. Jesus told us in John 14one to 3 Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus also alluded to the approval of his Father that was necessary. Matthew twenty four thirty and verse 36. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And he says it again. Uh, it's recorded in Mark 13:32-37. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. And he goes on to say, Take heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore. For ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. 
and what I say unto you I say unto all watch our job here is clear we as the bride are to watch the groom would often leave a servant to take care of the needs of the bride during their separation during the separation the groom was responsible for taking care of the needs of the bride exodus 21:10 tells us some of the responsibilities of the groom and later the husband if he take him another wife her food her raiment and her duty of marriage shall he not diminish we are told of the servant that jesus has left with us in john 3 5 jesus answered verily verily i say unto thee except a man be born of water we covered that and of the spirit he cannot enter into the kingdom of god so we already talked about the baptism and now we're talking about the holy spirit in second corinthians 1 21 and 22 there's a statement that used to puzzle me when i read it now he which established us with you in christ and hath anointed us is god who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the spirit in our hearts and it's repeated in second corinthians 5 5 now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is god who also hath given us the earnest of the spirit now if you've ever bought a house you know that to show you're serious about it you usually have to put down what is called earnest money in like manner jesus to show that he is serious about this marriage gives us the earnest of the spirit this is probably one of the reasons why it is so serious to grieve away the holy spirit the holy spirit is a betrothal gift to us then peter said unto them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the holy ghost acts 2 38 we're told in romans 8 26 and 27 that the spirit also helpeth our infirmities because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of god so he's taking care of our needs as long as we are true to our betrothal as jesus said therefore take no thought saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed for your heavenly father knoweth that ye have need of these things but seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you another point of interest about the betrothal is that while the groom builds the new home the bride waits and wears a veil and a headband with coins this shows she belongs only to the groom she is no more available this was apparently worn whenever a betrothed woman went out in public in genesis 24:65, we find rebecca veiling herself for she said unto the servant what man is this that walketh in the field to meet us and the servant had said it is my master therefore she took a veil and covered herself in song of solomon 5 6 and 7 we find his betrothed with a veil i opened to my beloved but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone my soul failed when he spake i sought him but i could not find him i called him but he gave no answer the watchmen that went about the city found me they smote me they wounded me the keepers of the walls took away my veil from me in fact even the greek word used for a bride in the bible suggests this veiling in john three twenty nine, it says he that hath the bride is the bridegroom and when we look in strong's this is the word numphe it's from a primary but obsolete verb meaning numpto which means to veil as a bride which it's it's very close to the latin numpto we've heard of the nuptials to marry that means a young married woman as veiled including a betrothed girl so this veiling took place at the betrothal in the bible our face represents our will this is from proverbs 21 29 a wicked man hardeneth his face but as for the upright he directeth his way and then again in jeremiah 5 3 it says their faces they have made their faces harder than a rock they have refused to return so one idea of veiling our face shows submission to god's will but let's line it up here in our sanctuary model at the entrance to the holy place which represented our covenant relationship with god we find the curtain 
or the veil, and five pillars. Exodus 26, 36, and 37 says, And thou shalt make an hanging for the door of the tent, of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twine linen wrought with needlework. And thou shalt make for the hanging five pillars of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold, and their hooks shall be of gold, and thou shalt cast five sockets of brass for them. You'll notice that when a person veils their face, they are basically veiling their five senses. In Luke 11:21 through 23 we find out, When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted, and divideth his spoils. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. So this is part of our protection for this palace, to keep our palace. Our five senses are like a bridge of protection, or could be destruction, between the world and our minds. Think of it as a drawbridge. We can choose to look at evil, or we can turn our heads or close our eyes. I once heard someone say, God put our head on a swivel so we can turn away our face from evil. Another writer has said, All should guard the senses, lest Satan gain victory over them, for these are the avenues to the soul. Jesus said, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from evil. John 17, 15. Before a very commonly used promise, we find these words that aren't read quite as commonly. He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from the holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from the hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil, he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be in the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him, his waters shall be sure. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. Isaiah 33, 15 through 17. This is a picture of guarding our senses and being veiled. If we guard our senses, we are effectively cutting off the access to the castle tower. Let's just do a brief study on what this might entail before we move on. We'll begin with the eyes. Jesus said in Luke 11:34, The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, thy whole body also is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body also is full of darkness. Remember the promise that we just read from Isaiah? It was for, for he that shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. He shall dwell on high. Psalm 101.3 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. This verse becomes even more interesting when we consider it in light of the TV set. I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. It's bad enough if we accidentally see it. It's even worse if we put it there to look at. We have several warnings for our ears too. Mark 4:24 says, And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear. And Luke 8:18 8, says, Take heed therefore how ye hear. In the story of the golden calf in Exodus 32, we find some insights into sounds connected with false worship. Exodus 32:17. Joshua hears noise of the people, and they shouted. And he says to Moses, there's noise of war in the camp. And then in Exodus 32, 18, Moses says, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. And then in Exodus 32, 19, they come down and they find them worshiping the golden calf and dancing. And this is where Moses cast the two tables of stone out of his hands and break, broke them. This was obviously a scene of false worship, and Joshua thought that the music was war. This is a biblical lesson that we should steer clear of music that might sound like shouting and war. Psalm 101.7 also applies to our ears. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell in my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. Psalm 119.29 says, Remove me from the way of lying, and grant me thy law graciously. 
Yet, how many of us don't even consider whether or not a TV program contains lying when we decide whether or not to watch it? Exodus 20, verse 7, again, reminds us from another perspective, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. We shouldn't be using God's name ruthlessly, neither should we listen to people doing it. For by beholding, we become changed. As for our mouth, 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whether therefore ye eat, or ye drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Ecclesiastes 10.17 builds on this a little bit when it says, Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. It does not glorify God when we eat things that make us sick or affect our frontal lobes, which is the seat of our will where God talks to us. However, let's not forget Psalm 34, 8, which says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. And Psalm 103, 2 and 5, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. God has given us an abundant supply of things that taste good and are good for us. He never asks us to give up anything without giving us something much better. I'm not going to cover the nose extensively in this presentation. We'll suffice it to say that our nose is given to us to help us know what is good for food. As a general rule, things that stink as do those that are fermented, should not be eaten. We also need to be careful with our touch. 2 Corinthians six seventeen says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Just as many physical diseases are caused by contamination from someone else who is sick, many spiritual diseases are caused by playing with sin. Yes, we are to witness, but Jude one twenty three says, And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. 1 Corinthians 6.14-17 says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. And one more from Ephesians 5.11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful dark works of darkness, but rather reprove them. We as a people are to be separate and distinct when we have to be out in the world, we should have our senses veiled. Now, at the veil to the holy place, we begin not only a separation from the world, but also a cleansing. Exodus 3.5 tells us that when Moses came on holy ground, he removed his shoes. And he, which is God in this verse, said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet. For the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. And in Esther 12, 11, and 12, it tells us something about some of the purifications that took place. And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did. Remember, Mordecai was Esther's cousin. Now, when every maid's turn was come to go in to King Ahasuerus, after that she had been twelve months according to the manner of women. For so were the days of their purifications accomplished, to wit, six months with oil of myrrh, and six months with sweet odors, and with other things for the purifying of women. So before any marriage, there was a, a purifying process that went on. In the holy place, this is our sanctification or cleansing process. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification that ye should abstain from fornication, 1 Thessalonians 4.3. So this sanctification process is extremely important if we are to stay true to God and not commit fornication. You can see how this lines up here. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way 
and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Remember, Jesus is the door, and we've lined one of these up at each door. The way is at the gate, the truth is the veil into the holy place, and the life the veil into the most holy. First Peter one twenty two says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, that's there at the veil, through the Spirit, we had the Holy Spirit that was working in there, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with pure heart fervently. This purification comes through the Holy Spirit. In 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. So the oil in the candlestick represents the Holy Spirit, and he's, so he's pictured here in the holy place. In John 16, 7, Jesus, as the bridegroom, said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So here is that cleansing process that's done through the work of the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. It is really quite beautiful what the Holy Spirit does for us. Romans eight twenty six and 27 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Today there are many people teaching that we have to be taught how to pray. But Jesus taught us the Lord's Prayer as an example, and then left us the Holy Spirit to translate what we say when we pray. God listens to our prayer, not because we can do anything of ourselves or because we can have fancy speech, but because Jesus covers us with his blood. It is this process of sanctification by the Spirit that we develop the characteristics found in Revelation 14:12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now a large part of this is the faith of Jesus. Romans 10:17 tells us, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So next we're going to move to the table of showbread, which represents the word of God, bread from heaven. Remember this verse in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, that it said, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So here's the sanctify, he's sanctifying it and cleansing it with the washing of water by the word. Now once I heard a story of a little boy who told the gardener, I don't know why I should keep reading my Bible, I just forget what I read. The gardener handed the boy a dirty basket and told him to go to the well and fill it with water. The boy tried and tried to fill it, but told the gardener it was it's never going to get full. The gardener said, yes, but now look, the dirty basket is clean, and we can put some fruit in it. In the same way, the Word of God cleanses us. The Bible, the Word of God, is a love letter from God to the world and from Jesus to his bride. Do you read and reread your Bible as a bride would a love letter from her bridegroom? Once, when my husband and I were dating, he wrote me a letter in Russian. Now, fortunately, I had a friend who knew Russian, and he translated it for me. When we are reading the Bible, the Holy Spirit is our interpreter. Jesus promised that he would send the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. Never should we study the Bible without first praying for the Holy Spirit to lead us. God has given us everything we need 
It's amazing. He left us this letter, and he left us the Holy Spirit to interpret it for us. Now, in the end of 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2, it referred to the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you look in our sanctuary model, this happens at the altar of incense, which is the only other piece of furniture in the holy place. Leviticus 4, 7 said, And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation. This is presented with our prayers to make them acceptable to God. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Revelation 8.3 The blood is also part of our cleansing process. In Revelation 7.14 we find, And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now we're going to cover something that we would call the hope chest. And although I found no evidence of something called a hope chest in the Hebrew traditions, the concept is still there. Because while the groom was away building the house, the bride should be getting ready the things that she would use in her new home. When you're moving soon, you don't spend time decorating your present home. All your thoughts and planning are for the future. This is what we've been directed to do. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 19, 21. Luke 12, 34 through 36 reminds us, Again, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let your loins be girded about, and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. So we need to be there waiting at the door, ready for him. We are moving soon. Are you packing? During this time, the bride also learns to be like the virtuous woman of Proverbs 31. She will sow the things that she may need later and maybe practice her cooking skills. As it says, she layeth her hand to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. She also learns to look well to the ways of a household. Now, Proverbs 11.22 reminds us of something that we don't want to be like. As a jewel of gold in a swine snout, so is a fair woman without discretion. So discretion is something that a good wife should aim to have. It means intelligence, judgment, reason, taste, understanding. She needs to have knowledge and understanding. This is interesting because in regards to the church, which is the bride, in Hosea 4, 6, it says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. We are to be developing a knowledge of the will of God and applying it to our lives. We are even told in the Bible what we are to be thinking about. Have you ever been around someone who is getting ready to be married? Their spouse-to-be seems like all they can think about. In Philippians 4.8 it tells us, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. This is a description of our bridegroom, Jesus Christ. He is the truth. His ways alone are just. There is nothing more lovely, and no one more worthy of praise. It's that simple. We are to be thinking of our bridegroom, 
Jesus. He is to be everything to us.